Addiction to prescription opiates is a growing crisis that crosses all social and economic levels. Whether it begins with efforts to treat pain or with the use of illegally purchased prescription drugs, the impact is devastating on individuals, on families, and communities. What happens when powerful addictive medications are made widely available to the general public? How can we balance the needs of people in pain with the need to protect patients from the risks of addiction? And how should we respond to individuals, families, and communities for whom the use of opiate drugs has gone horribly wrong? The whole sphere of, of treating patients with pain with opiates has something that's grown tremendously in the last 20 years. It was back, if you go back, 40, 50 years ago, we thought that opiates were so addictive that they really were a drug that, that were unsafe to use. And our cancer patients with demanding better treatment for pain really said, you know, there has to be something better. And we were fairly aggressive about treating with them with, for their pain and found their quality of life's better, they're performing better. And then people said, well, should we not be looking at this group of drugs for people with chronic pain? And we sort of then started pushing the envelope and we found that for people with chronic pain, that as a class of medications, there was a huge sort of growth in what you can do for these people. People then suddenly, they would come into your office and say, you know, I have my wife back, I have my life back, I can do other things, my life is much more functional. Well, opiates uh, work. I mean, that's, that's why we use them, that's why we always use them, and especially with people with extreme pain, people dying from cancer. Uh, who are suffering significant pain. Opiates work, they do help. The only thing is uh, we know we're always tickling the dragon's tail and run the risk of addiction. I can just go over this case with you here. Doctors prescribing opiates, first off, have to be cautious and, and don't fall into this false belief they're less addictive than what we thought. Especially the newer agents we're using are far more euphoric far more addictive than the older agents we used to use, like codeine and even morphine. All of us will develop tolerance or physical dependence to these type of agents. It's rare you can find somebody you could give them a narcotic for three months straight, stop it instantly, and they have no withdrawal whatever. And what withdrawal is, is when the drug disappears, they now feel what it's like to have created a shutdown in their own pain-reducing mechanisms. Everything's gonna ache. You're gonna ache all over. You're gonna start having headaches. You're gonna have also other things like anxiety, depression. You will just feel very agitated, on edge, restless. All of us have that potential. I was in a car accident. I had uh, multiple injuries. I had a dislocated hip. Uh, torn ligaments in my knee and other injuries, whiplash, head injury and such. I was given the painkillers for the pain. Everybody knew that I did not want anything that was addictive. And they told me that as long as you were taking it for pain, there was no way that I would be able to get addicted to it. They said, you won't have a problem with it. I would start to not take them to see if I could control not taking them, I would take them less um, in the dosage. I would take them, you know, in a weaning process, what they call it, I guess. And I would stop all of a sudden. I would throw my pills down the toilet and I would start to feel suicidal. I would start to feel so erratic. I would, f I would feel so out of control. And that is, I wasn't a mom and that to me, broke almost every fiber within me, not just the oxycontinent taking control of my body and my mind. It was the feeling of not being there for my children. Every month, I would have a uh, week to two weeks where I would try to get off these pills and it would be so difficult and my kids would be so lost that I would go and I would get my, my refill again. And this went on until uh, I had found out about a methadone clinic on my own because my, the doctor 
they just didn't seem to want to have anything to do with me at that point. I actually had one pharmacist ask me if I was weaning myself off of heroin. And I got so mad. It was very difficult to deal with because everybody has this preconceived notion. If you're addicted, then, well, you must have been, you must have liked taking it or something. And it was like, you know, I chose not to do this. I, I originally started out thinking, in my hospital bed, I can handle this. And I ended up being a crying, sniveling, suicidal person in a corner of the bathroom three years later. About 12 years ago, I was involved in a rear end uh, five-ton truck came and smashed into the rear of my car. And I ended up in hospital at Sunnybrook with a uh, lacerated spleen and back problems and so forth. I was on Percocet. I was on the, uh, the heavy medications to kill the pain. So in the end, it actually ended up where I was on, uh, I believe, 32 different medications for pain, for depression, there were so many medications that I was actually becoming addicted. I guess I didn't realize how destructive it could be with my marriage, with my connection to my family, my children, my grandchildren, until I guess I uh, went for recovery. Many older people have no knowledge of medications. They were not brought up to the knowledge that people have today. And another thing is they put physicians on a pedestal and they are not God. What could help lessen um, the attractiveness, the need, and the use of prescription opiates for older people? Well, number one, making them fully aware, if at all possible, and I'm saying this, what the dangers are. Not just taking the medication for themselves, but to their families. Because the addiction problem, especially of an opiate, is momentarily they have that euphoria, they feel fine and they're happy and they share that. But once they've come down, what happens? They take the anger out on everyone and they hurt not only themselves, but their spouses, their children, their grandchildren, society as a whole. And then they receive the reputation of, I don't want anything to do with them. So again, what happens? They back in the same slot but my family wants nothing to do with me. I can't socialize because nobody wants to talk to me. So my, my best investment is an opiate. That's my friend. a rather dramatic increase in the prevalence rates of opiate dependency and opiate addiction within this community and within our region. Even two years ago, uh, the rate of opiate dependency in terms of folks that were coming for treatment was at about 10%. And even at that time, it was primarily your street drugs, such as heroin. Um, in the last two years, we've seen a dramatic shift toward prescription opiates. And this is all age groups, youth, older adults, adults. Uh, the stats are now approaching 50% of the clients that are coming through um, our services are opiate dependent and struggling with opiate dependency. And we're really struggling in order to be able to respond effectively to the needs of the communities that are just now really being identified. I started off doing Oxy 20s and 40s when I was just turning 20 years old. I owned a gas station a couple houses up from my parents' house, and a customer came in one day, and he worked at the mill, and he's like, Chris, you'll cook, you have a hangover. And I said, yeah, I got a hangover. He's like, here, try one of these. This will take away your hangover. I'm like, okay. I didn't know what a perk was or even a, I just thought it was like a Tylenol, a little bit stronger. I didn't, had no idea what pills were at all. I've done every other drug under the world, not those. So it's just like, here, swallow this. I did. Within half hour, my headache was gone and I was high, like high like I've never been in my life. 
And then he came in the next day, I'm like, what the hell was that? And he's like, it was an Oxy-40. And then after he started coming in with 40, so he's like, here, try snorting it. So at first I was all apprehensive, how could I snort this miracle drug that you're supposed to swallow? And I did, and that's when I got hooked because instead of it hitting you after an hour, half hour, it hits you within 10 seconds. So it went from every two days to every day to doing it three times a day. And it just escalated. It's such an addictive substance, I don't know. It sucked me right in. For the first six months, as many as I did, I got that high. But after a while, my tolerance built up that you just needed to survive. It ruined my family life with all my friends and my family. No one wanted to talk to me anymore because I was always had an opinion for them or I, I, I'd always put you down or think I was better than you because I was high on these things. It ruined my relationship with my girlfriend. It drained me financially. I spent $75,200 in 13 months. I lost my business, everything. You name it, it took it all away from me. I went to my parents' house in the middle of November, just before Christmas. I wasn't living at home anymore because of my oxy abuse. You know, they didn't want me around and stuff. And they said, Chris, you're still welcome to come here for Christmas. So for that next month after that, I tried cutting myself off, weaning myself off. I just wanted to go home clean for my family. And it, it, was, it was hard, you know what I mean? Like, it, it, was, it was very hard to try to go cold turkey or try to wean yourself off, and it just wasn't doable. I reached out on December 10th, called my mom, and I said, Mom, I need you to drive me to the hospital because I don't have, not the physical strength, I don't have the mental strength to bring myself there right now, I just can't. And she picked me up, and I was there within 10 minutes of the phone call, and that was probably the best day of my life, just that feeling. I cried the whole way there, I cried the whole time I was in the hospital, just getting out all that self-hatred and all those emotions, all that built-up anger I had for what I did to myself and to my family and all that, you know what I mean? I was, I was not numb to the outside world no more, it felt good. The problem is large, my man, large. Larger than anyone assumes or knows. The kids just don't understand that now that how bad it is and stuff. They think they can, just like me, oh, I can do one, I can do two, I can do seven, I can do 10. But week in and week out, as that tolerance builds up and you don't get that normal feeling anymore, that you're high off life and life is all good, that's when, that's when you start crashing. People are dying, people are robbing, breaking into pharmacies, stabbing people for them, raw, everything. It's, it's an epidemic. Well, our job is uh, to provide safe injection supplies to injection drug users in the city of Thunder Bay. Also to provide harm reduction services for the entire community um, by picking up of publicly discarded syringes, making sure that injection supplies are, are disposed of properly, and to help reduce the spread of bloodborne disease among the injection drug using population. The number one drug primarily was cocaine, uh, people injecting cocaine. That is now switched that we're seeing more and more people um, injecting opiates. We've delivered syringes in neighborhoods where the houses are $450,000 down to working basically in the alleys and the downtown cores. So there is no sort of typical injection drug user. Um, especially with opiates, it seems that it's, it's really right across the whole spectrum of, of people. A large number of our clients have lost everything. Uh, where the only thing left for them to do to provide supports for their chronic use is to end up out on the streets and become involved in sex trade. And, and they're, they're so cut off from all the rest of their family and any kind of supports that it makes it really difficult to have any kind of lifestyle changes. It's really hard to change your life when you're living in an eight by six room sharing a common bathroom, or you're cycling in and out of shelters and you literally have nothing left. And we run into that a lot, especially around the oxy stuff and the opiate stuff, where people have literally lost everything they own, everything they've ever had as far as supports. Oftentimes with doctors, GPs who are very well intentioned, uh, want to help and their first initiative or first uh, instinct is to cut the person off completely. They say, that's it, you get no more oxys, that'll cure your addiction. It doesn't work that way. That often drives them to other sources then to get the pills that they, that they physically 
uh, are craving for at that point. Never mind the psychological uh, cravings, but physically they actually need that pill to keep from getting sick. So when the doctors do that, as well intentioned as they may be, it just increases the drug trade on the street. A lot of people, their idea around chronic substance use or addictive, addictive behavior is coming at it from a moral point of view instead of that the person has an illness that needs to be treated as an illness. You know, addiction's been around since the very first substance was ever introduced, and it's not going away. Um, it needs to be looked at with less morality and more reality. speak about every six weeks, him and I, and we'd have long talks on the phone. And, and the last year and a bit, I, I hardly ever heard from him. And, but then when I did talk to him, he was always um, really down, really, his speech was really slow. He was very grumpy. And then I started to worry about him that, you know, is he, is he depressed or what's going on with him? Finally, when I got him to tell me what it was, was the problem, um, he said, Mom, I'm addicted to a drug. And, um, you know, I, I wasn't a shocked mom. I, I just said, what, Ben, what, what drug, which one, what? And he said, OxyContin. And he said, I tried to get off of it a couple of times, and he said, I can't. One big obstacle was that most places did not want the person who wants to recover unless he had already kicked the drug. They don't want somebody actively using. But, but the, probably the most critical part of getting off this stuff is kicking the drug because the withdrawal is supposed to be obscene, actually. There was no medical detox for him. He said, if I keep taking this, he would die by next year, and I think he meant that he would just spontaneously die, like his body would just give in to it. And, uh, and then he said to me, he said, if I don't get help by the middle of next week, he said, I'm not going to make it. And that's the night I got off the phone with him, and I started crying, and I said to him, I said, I'm afraid he's going to kill himself. Um... I, I could just hear that, that desperation in his voice that he, he was serious. He couldn't, he, couldn't, um, he couldn't do it by himself. And he just felt like nobody was helping him quick enough. It was a Tuesday night, and I walked in the house, and um, the front door was open. It was cold out, and I thought that was a little unusual. And... And I heard my husband on the phone, and he was talking very quietly, and I heard him say, she's home. And then I realized it was Ben. I fell to the floor. I fell to the floor. I crawled in the corner, actually, of the kitchen. I, and I stayed there. I, I couldn't, I wasn't able to get up until my pastor at some point later got me up. It's a night I'll never forget. I'll never forget. There was a whole line of people at the funeral, and one guy in particular came up to me, and he was um, a very tall, good-looking young guy. He was crying before he even spoke, and he said, I'm addicted too. And he says, and I have four little kids. So, you know, not only are moms and dads and friends and adult family being affected, but kids are being affected to it too by losing their parents to it.
to have problems with prescription drugs. It was always there, but it was very small. But in the past, what, a year, year and a half, it just exploded. Uh, kids from 14 to uh, people that are in their 70s, 60s and 70s are addicted to this stuff on reserve now. You go practically every second, third house, people are being affected because of this issue here. One of the stories I had me was when I, I was walking around with my daughter on the reserve, and it was a Friday night, and uh, a guy came up to me and he says, you know, Frank, it's, uh, it's, it's nice, isn't it? It's nice and quiet. You can walk around Friday. There's no broken beer bottles. There's no people running around yelling around. He says, you know, it's, it's good. And he says, you know, the, because people inside are doing pills rather than drinking. At least with alcohol, they do it one, two nights, and then, they, and then uh, they're sober. But with this thing, it's like you lost that person. That person's gone. What I am really concerned about is our children, our babies. They're recognizing what they see at home. That's what's so, that's what's so bad about what they're doing, because they're showing their children. And when, and when, and when you see the children um, pretending to do those things, you know, you know they've learned something. What we're having here this afternoon is uh, like an open forum. We're looking at the issues around prescription drugs, uh, how it's affecting our community, how it's affecting our families, and when, again, what we're looking for is the input from community and how we can make this a safer and better place for us to live in a healthier community. And, you know, we have some invited guests uh, you know, to help us out with any questions that we have. It's coming to a point where, where do we turn? Who do we call? And ourselves as workers is, we're out there searching for certain resources, how we could address this issue and bring this, this programming and this service to our community. We have three little wee kids, okay? Five, six, and two, three years old. They were left alone. Their mother is all pilled up. Mm -hmm. She's pilled up. In order for these kids to, you know, survive, you know where they are to keep them safe, we took them because those kids were left alone. The little girl did not want to go home. She says, Grandma, we're left alone. Mother sleep all the time. Daddy gone. They're gone. This is what we're living with now. This is what we're crying. We are crying right now. We need help. When you deal with addiction, that person has to be ready to make that change. But as a community, looking at, at what services we can offer here, where we can take people, what aftercare we're going to provide, because even bringing people to Thunder Bay for methadone treatment, they have to leave their community right now. And is that fair to them? that every person who lives in a northern remote area has to leave their community to go get treatment. When the person comes back to the community, what are we gonna do then? What services, what supports, what sort of education? Education is a big component around addiction, teaching the children about the dangers of it, that when you're at a party and somebody crushes up a pill, talk to them about how just snorting one pill can kill you. They need to know how strong and powerful these opiates are. Is that Junior? That's Junior, yeah. Did you work here? That's Tyson. Tyson? What usually happened before is we'd get programs where we get people from, I don't know, Thunder Bay, Toronto and elsewhere coming in and saying, okay, we're gonna try this, we should do this. And we found out that we ended up back into the same position again. So I think what we've come to realize is that we have to do it ourselves. I mean, Nishnabi Indian people, it's our issue, it's our problem. I mean, if the resources and things like that were available to us, we have to do it ourselves. The disease of addiction is uh, a very marginalized illness. Um, society doesn't understand it very well. Doctors don't understand it very well. Um, I think to bring it out into the open um, as an illness that is um, as treatable uh, and as deserving of treatment as anything else like heart disease or diabetes is, uh, um, would be wonderful. The solution to opioid dependence, 
problems in a community is not just the responsibility of physicians or the addiction agency or the hospital or a community agency. It is everybody's responsibility to come together to help people who have this problem in a community because, not because it's just the right thing to do for that individual, but it's the right thing to do for the community because this has huge implications on families, on the workforce, on the law and order situation. It really makes a lot of sense for communities to come together and say, how can we help this person with this addiction uh, recover and become a productive member of society? I was born in London, so I, I have family around here. I grew up on a farm, so it's kind of like coming home. It's in the middle of nowhere. I quit doing heroin a long time ago, cold turkey, uh, locked myself in my brother's attic, and uh, got real, real, real sick. It's the worst sickness that I've ever had to go through in my life. But I ended up having an operation on my arm. And when I got out of the hospital, or when I came out of the anesthetic, I was on a morphine drip, which is basically heroin. It's just a pharmaceutical version of it. You basically start where you left off. So I didn't, you know, start chipping. I went right from getting out of the hospital to doing $100 worth of morphine a day. Perks weren't cutting it. So I ended up with Dilaudid, morphine, Oxycontin, you know, whatever I could get my hands on. Someone had told me about methadone. Actually, what had happened is I was sitting in a restaurant and it was a girl I knew who was on methadone and she sold me some of her methadone and said, here, try this, see if this takes care of your pain. So I did and it did. It stopped me from needing it that day. So I thought, okay, well, maybe this will work. Three times a week now, I have to hitchhike into London to uh, go to my clinic. But that's a choice I make because, to put it in terms that anyone could understand, if you had kidney transplant, and the only way that you could live is if you hitchhiked into town twice a week for dialysis, you'd do that. Absolutely, in a heartbeat. So. In my mind, it's the same thing. If it saves my life, then I'll do whatever it takes. I'm a family doctor, which means I uh, provide primary care to people. I'm the first first person that they would come to see if they have a cough or a cold or a sore back. Um, and uh, I also happen to prescribe methadone too. I was working in a community health center about 10 years ago who had a mandate to provide medical care to people who were in the homeless shelters. And so I saw a lot of drug problems and I didn't know what to do. Someone recommended to me, uh, there's, a, well, there's this course in Toronto on methadone you should go check out. So I went and um, it was the solution that I was looking for. Okay. I think we increased your dose last time, mate. Uh, how'd that go? Uh, good, yeah, no, I'm glad. I think yeah. it's been going better. Okay, so it's yeah. lasting the full 24 hours? Yeah. Okay, it's not good. As, yeah, it's better. All right, good, good set. Sure. The thing about methadone that's special is it's an ultra-long-acting opioid. Methadone doesn't cause a person to be high and it also prevents them from going into withdrawal. So they don't have to worry about when they're going to take their next dose or they're going to get their next dose. I can see changes in people very quickly after they start on the program. They come in to see me one or two weeks after starting and their faces are brighter, their mood is better. I love my job because people turn their lives around. They, they go from literally living on the streets to uh, going back to school, getting jobs, 
reuniting with their families. Their quality of life improves tremendously. Those of us in the methadone community are all really excited about buprenorphine. It's also an, an ultra-long acting opioid. Buprenorphine is safer uh, in terms of overdose. There is evidence also that buprenorphine may be easier to get off of uh, than methadone. We started running a pilot for methadone here in the Oasis Clinic uh, last year. In terms of methadone in general in the landscape, Ottawa has historically been a, a severely underserviced community. We have estimates of need of between 12 and 1600 methadone treatment spaces in the city, and we have a between three and 400 treatment spaces available. So there's a huge underservice for methadone in Ottawa. Most often communities are concerned about issues of open drug use, publicly discarded needles, things like that that, that uh, create unsafe neighborhoods. Methadone offers a solution to those issues for that portion of, the, of uh, addicted people who are addicted to opiates. Methadone helps with a lot of different kind of social problems. Um, the first that come to mind is crime. I mean, someone using um, opioids off the street, often people have really miserable lives um, doing petty crimes or prostitution um, in order to acquire their drugs. Um, putting them on methadone means they don't have to do that anymore. Um, people can also take better care of their health. Methadone can be a lifesaver in some individuals. Typically, these are individuals who've had the diagnosis of opioid dependence for at least a year, people who are unable to stop by other means. So they've been through detoxification, they've tried psychosocial treatments alone and by themselves, but they're unable to stop completely or they're very short periods of remission but keep going back. Those are the kinds of individuals where you'd say, you know what, this is a good candidate for somebody to go on to, to methadone. On the other hand, if you have somebody who's a short-term user of opioids, probably less than a year, that's not as clear that that person should go on to methadone because potentially one could be stepping up their level of dependence and the treatment may be longer than the duration that they had a problem. So methadone is not a panacea and neither is buprenorphine for all prescription opioid users. Other treatment options include counseling, self-help groups like Narcotics Anonymous, uh, detoxification programs, outpatient uh, tapering protocols, and uh, maybe even going away to therapeutic communities which take people in for you know six months or longer, uh, where they really work on, on that person getting away from drugs. Methadone is an important cornerstone for the treatment of opioid dependence. However, it is not sufficient simply to write prescriptions for methadone to patients. Clearly, in some circumstances, that may be all that's available in a certain given community. But as physicians, either we provide some levels of counseling, which may be simple, practical, problem-solving counseling, or more appropriately, refer them on to counselors within the community who can actually help these individuals reach their full potential and recovery. Hey, Lisa. Hey, you got a minute? Yeah. So what's up? Hey, I want to talk to you about a client. Um, I'm Sarah. the methadone case manager here at the Sandy Hill Community Health Center. My job, I guess, would be to take all the pieces that surround methadone maintenance treatment and help the client make it happen. Some clients, they need help with uh, mental health issues. Others need help setting goals, vocational training, uh, beating poverty, finding housing. I work very closely with uh, Dr. Bromley uh, we work together because we find that it enhances the treatment outcomes. So she'll take the medication piece and I'll take um, linking up with community resources. I um, also help them uh, develop a sense of resiliency. I think it's really important uh, not to look at methadone as the only solution for opioid dependence. Um, I think it's important that uh, there's a wide range of choices that people can have uh, in terms of how to manage their illness. and. Um, that people can access different choices at different stages of their treatment. Certainly methadone is great to get people stabilized, but once they've got on methadone, well, it's important to have other, other resources. Um, addiction counseling is really important. And when someone comes to the point where they're thinking of that it's time to come off of methadone, that they have the counseling support that uh, enables them to do that su successfully. I have people in my practice who 
have lost everything. They've started out with jobs and families and businesses and um, because of their opioid dependence problem have lost all of that and uh, have ended up on the streets. It breaks my heart. Uh, here in Ottawa there aren't enough methadone doctors and I have a waiting list that's a year long and um, it's, uh, it's, it's really, really hard um, to, to have people wait that long to, to get onto treatment. Methadone saved my life, so basically I would do anything to get it. I've hitchhiked in snowstorms where it's taken two and a half hours to go half an hour's drive just so I could go get my prescription because, like I said in the beginning, it's the only thing that's ever worked. So if this works and this has allowed me to go from living in a hotel room with a bed, a table, and a glass full of syringes to, you know, I have, you know, stuff. I have a VCR, I have, you know, movies I can watch, I have cable television, I have a telephone. I've never had a telephone in my own name, ever. It's amazing, you know. So if I can keep that, I'll do anything to keep that. No community is immune to the health and social costs of prescription opiate addiction. If we're going to solve this problem, it will require the determined efforts of healthcare professionals, policymakers, drug manufacturers, and others who bear responsibility for the health and safety of the public. The solution will also require the courage of individuals and communities to come together, to reach out, and to connect. Ask questions, expect answers, and advocate for services that will enable all of us to make informed choices about our health and well-being. <laughs>